All right, and we are live with another episode of the Rider Review Podcast brought to you by 13K Productions. Uh, And today's actually a special episode, a monumental episode, as we are introducing our official co-host of this podcast, Tyson Craney. (laughs) Let, let uh, Let the applause ring down, or I guess... We don't have a plus. We don't have sound effects yet, <laughs> um, but uh, we're coming to you after a uh, a tough loss for the Riders, uh, where they played really well, but uh, unfortunately fell to the best team in the CFL. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, they fell 45-27 to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to go one and one on the season, uh, and the Bombers are two and zero as pretty much expected by everybody else outside of the hopefuls in Saskatchewan. Um, First, let's just start off, Tyson. Um, what what did you make of the game? Um, first and foremost, here, thanks for having me back, Caden. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to be back talking football. This is awesome. I live and breathe this stuff. So, um, thirty thousand foot view overall. Uh, we gave them a game. Uh, we gave them a game with argue, arguably our B team playing right. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged. A loss is a loss and that's the only stat that really matters, right? Let's be honest, but, uh, I'm encouraged from, from what I saw. What about you? Um, yeah, like you said, it was our B team. Uh, we had, uh, Tevin Jones out there. We had Sean Bain, Sean Bain Jr., Sam Emlis that like, these are a bunch of guys that don't normally start. I mean, aside from Sean Bain and, you know, Winnicky was out there too, but um, with Walker being out and uh, Philip Blake being out for a while, and KSB is going to be out uh, till midseason, right? Yeah. Um, the fact that those guys are injured and those are a few of our main starters, right? And this team still put up a really good fight, mind you. The score might not show it against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers of all teams. That's that's a great sign that the season is looking looking upwards. Yeah, so, I agree. I agree. Yeah, so um, let's just go over the stats here. Trevor Harris um, went 29 of 41 uh, for 405 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, Jamal Morrow had six carries for 25 yards. Uh, and Trevor Harris actually carried the ball three times for 23 yards. Um, so I just want to want to make a quick comment on uh, Jamal Morrow. Um, last, last night I, w- I went to the game and <clears> – <throat> I was saying this last week. I really, I'm scared about Jamal Morrow because it seems as though he is only a fourth quarter running back. Because uh, throughout the game, I was noticing he was only, only getting max two, three yards per carry until that big run in the fourth quarter again, and that that seemed to happen uh, last week in Edmonton too. So. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I guess I don't know if that perceived lack of production is on the O-line, which is makeshift, right? This is not our starting O-line. Um, or if it is on the backs, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's, it's definitely something I've made note of. Like our run game, which was supposed to be our strong suit coming into the season is is not great. Apart from that four minute drive in the Eskimos game, sorry, the Elks game, um, we haven't really shown much. Now we're facing the best defense in the league, in my opinion, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So you know, there's um, there's a reason. Uh, I'm not impressed with Moro and Frankie Hickson. I haven't rewatched the game, but I'm I'm reading that he went out in the first quarter possibly the first play even. So that's no good. Um, and I mean, <clears throat> you can take, you can take certain positives out of, out of that, out of him being a fourth quarter running back, you know, that's in the fourth quarter there. That's where you can say, you know, the offensive line should be tiring out. And, you know, as you have rotation going on all over that defensive line, you know, the defensive line should be fresh, but that's when our, our running backs start to shine. Um, and then uh, moving on to the receiving core, Sean Bain Jr. had a really good game with uh, six receptions for 125 yards. Actually led the led yep. the team in receiving yards, uh, which I didn't even realize now. Just till I'm just reading the stats. Um, yeah. 
Tevin Jones led the team in receptions, uh, had nine receptions for 121 yards. Um, a little note on Tevin Jones. Um, visually, he played really good, even though he didn't score a touchdown. Um, I keep telling everybody that'll listen. Um, to me, Tevin Jones looks like a very, very underrated receiver. Yeah. I'm surprised this guy isn't starting. The, he has really great speed, quickness, and he, he will run through a DB. What are your thoughts yeah. on Tevin Jones? Uh, I've been high on Tevin Jones uh, up in, starting last year. Um, I think the only reason he, he's an NFL body, like he is. He, you can tell the way he runs routes. You can tell the way he makes adjustments. Um, you can tell his demeanor in the huddle from what we see on TV. Um, and he did spend time in the NFL, and it, he just smacks of that NFL type receiver. Um, I believe the only reason he's not starting is because we started with such a, a plethora of, of receiver depth. It, it seemed at the time, right? We had Satterfield, we cut him. Yeah. Uh, Keith Corbin, the third, we cut him. Two dynamite receivers. Um, uh, you know, and he probably wouldn't have started this game if not for Darrell Walker being on the freaking six game. So. Yeah. And I think if if you look towards last season, I mean, a lot of people don't want to do that because, you know, we we shouldn't really be talking about last season. I, I know I don't, but um, I, you got to point out that one game later in the season against the Argos um, where he and Jake Dolagala had just amazing, had an amazing repertoire. Him and Dolagala were just on the same page the entire game. Um, and, I mean, once again, we saw this game with Trevor Harris and – I he, I think he just meshes w- really well with the quarterbacks. Um, and then we get to the uh, quite possibly the best receiver of this game. I think you know who I'm going to talk about. Um, number 19 himself, Sam Emelis, or as he calls himself, Sam Himmelis, because, I mean, <laughs> right, rightfully, rightfully so, he is him. He had seven receptions for 77 yards and three touchdowns. That's a hat trick. And I think he did it in... Well, he did it in the first three quarters of the game. So what do you make of that? Um, I am more than willing to eat crow on this. I was flat out kicked off last year. I watched the CFL draft I do every year because I'm a nerd like that. But I watched it last year, and I was ticked that we didn't take the U of our O-lineman, Noah Zer. Um, I can't believe it. was. I was shocked. Um to go ahead and take Emelis. And my thoughts were backed up from the product he put on the field last year. Now, granted, he wasn't given a ton of run, but uh, when he was, he didn't do anything with it. And like I said, I am more than happy to eat my words. Um, he he got the hat trick, like you said, kid. Uh, he seems like a sure-handed receiver. Um, I like his, his awareness of space on the field, I suppose. Um, so it's beauty. I'm happy for him. He seems like a good dude. The team loves him. Trevor loves him. Uh, and, you know, cohesion is a big, a big, big part of winning. Um, I will point out, though, he dropped a, a sure touchdown last last week in Edmonton, too. So let's not forget about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, receivers aren't, you know, made until they've till they've been consistent. And, I mean, this is really the first game that Sam MLS has really, really stood out. Uh, but, I mean... He deserves credit where it's due, and he had a really good game. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Jake Winnicky, um, he had four receptions for 36 yards. Um, and throughout the game, I was noticing that uh, he he didn't look the greatest. He dropped a few passes that he could have caught. Um, how, what do you think of uh, Winnicky's play? Uh, I'm disappointed, but, you know, we were we – were, um led to believe that it, it was going to be an instant connection, right? They played together yeah. before, and they're both brothers, right, and all that stuff. So I think we were kind of led down the primrose path there, as they say, a little bit, um, with maybe some unrealistic expectations. That's probably not the right word, but probably we were led to believe that it would happen sooner than it it uh, appears to have, have happened. Um, I have no doubts about Winnikey's. Uh, talent on the field. I have no doubt about his connection with Trevor. It just takes time. It's not like he's invisible. He's going to be, if he's not the number one receiver this year, he'll be uh, top two or three. I have 
hundred percent confidence in Winicky. Um, and then uh, with uh, some smaller numbers here, Juwan Breskison with two receptions for twenty nine yards, and Jamal Morrow with one reception for seventeen yards. Did anything stand out to you about Breskison or uh, Jamal Morrow in the receiving game? No, it was a nice catch by Jamo. That's he's a scout back. He's able to do that, right? If we put that play in there for him more often, he would get more catches. He's that type of athlete. I have zero worries about him. One great catch, yada yada. Um, I gotta, I gotta bring it up. I don't know if you agree. I'm not sure where I stand, but why isn't Picton in there? Uh, I don't know. Preston yeah. Is, Slower than a sundial, dude. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I was talking to my uh, dad before the game, and and he he was saying the same thing. It, it, Picton has been on this team for what three, four years now, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's just, he's good old Saskatchewan boy, and I, I really, I really think he, uh, he deserves his chance, and the fact that he's not getting it. Must say something about that coaching staff. I just I don't think they see what everybody else sees. So that that's another knock against uh, um, Craig Dickinson, uh, who we will get to later in this podcast, as I'm sure you know where where we'll be going with that. Um, but um, let's move on to the defensive side of the ball here. Uh, Larry Dean had ten tackles. Pete Robertson had five tackles and a sack. Uh, Roland Milligan with five tackles and uh, Deontay Williams with five tackles. Um, Pete Robertson, um, the game was a little bit underwhelming for the defense, for the defensive line as a whole, I should say, um, with only one sack being had. What, what do you make of that uh, defensive line play? Um, the defensive line has not changed in my opinion. It is the strength of our team. It might possibly be the best in the league, certainly right up there, top two, three. Um, so my stance on our defensive line has not changed, will not change. Uh, we're against the the biggest, baddest, um, yeah. <laughs> most expensive O line in the league. That's it, period. Um, was I disappointed in our pass rush? Um, absolutely, it, it, it was almost non-existent. Um, like I said, I haven't rewatched the game or anything. I'm a little disappointed I didn't hear Brian Cox, his name come up a little the, bit more. I think we lost him for a second here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like like he was saying. Kind of froze. I think we're losing connection. <laughs> oh. There we go. There we go. We're back. <laughs> okay. Sorry, man. I was just saying I'm I, – I, our defensive line is the strength of our team. I was disappointed that I didn't see Brian Cox in there a little more. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the linebacking core, um, to me, it, it didn't really seem like. I, I think Winnipeg was a little bit uh, more, you know, vigilant of that linebacking core because they're they are a really good linebacking core. Um, there wasn't very many passes thrown by Zach Claros over the middle. To, to any of his receivers, really, like in, in that little five-yard range. Uh, most of the passes were really downfield. And um, speaking of going downfield, um, I think Jaden Dalkey. I mean, he. I think he made one bigger hit later in the uh, later in the game on Dalton Shane. I think it was. Um, but the. I mean. I think it's to be expected um, with Winnipeg's receivers. They have really, really good receivers. Um, even though Winnipeg shined throwing the ball, I still think Saskatchewan had a great game uh, in the pass defense. What What do you think about Saskatchewan's pass defense game there? Uh, a little disappointed, to be honest. Um, I don't know if they were playing uh, – uh, a softer defense if they were playing more of his own or whatever i don't know i'll i'll revisit i got a week to to revisit the game and <laughs> kind of pick apart stuff but uh initial reaction i was disappointed in our secondary um we did lose our captain though nick marshall he's the captain of that secondary um we lost him he's on the sixth game which don't panic you can take him off at any time yeah um 
so yeah, Nick Marshall, that's our ball hawk. Uh, that's that hurts, and we lost Jaden Dalkey in the first half, I think. Uh, we did, and he came back in the second half, I guess. So yep. that's your starting safety and your ball hawk, um, wide side field or short side field corner. So that hurts, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of uh, Nick Marshall, uh, the or I guess the guy that came in to replace him, uh, Deontay Williams. Uh, this this was outside the game. Uh, so his um, back when uh, his mother was um, not in a great place, um, there was a woman. I guess uh, I think it was the wife of uh, his uh, coach uh, took him in and uh, was basically his family while his mom was going through some hard times. And um, it wasn't planned that. Uh, Williams was going to start this game, uh, but I guess his family made the trip to Saskatchewan to come watch Deontay Williams play in in what was just a storybook. I guess I guess you can call it storybook luck story. I I don't know what to call that. What 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 do you think of that? Yeah, the 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 proverbial tough luck luck story. Um, yeah, I've heard a little bit about that. I haven't read into that personally yet. I will, I'm sure, but um, he impressed in training camp. There was a lot of people that were calling for him to make the team straight out, like our sixth or fifth DD, I suppose, right? Um, yeah. There was a lot of talk about that. Um, so he, um, there's no surprise there, really. He he is what we thought he was. <laughs> and uh, if he turns out to be our, our fifth DB, um, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, uh, even in preseason, I I noticed Deontay Williams was just yeah. shining. They yeah. they were saying even on even on the TSN broadcast there, they were saying everybody loves this guy. He is a pleasure to be around, and I hope this guy sticks around. Yeah. Um, so now uh, a penalty later in the fourth quarter. Um, I can't remember who it was on. I think it might have been on Henderson. Um, when him and I think it was Shane again. Shane was Shane was a very prominent uh, receiver in this game. <laughs> um, they both went up for the ball, and there was a ticky tacky pass interference call, uh, pass interference flag thrown on that, and the entire stadium was yelling at Craig Dickinson to throw the challenge flag, and he did not throw the challenge flag. It's it's something that he was given criticism for uh last year um mm -hmm. and i think i think he's a little bit um he's a little bit more hesitant now to throw it uh but i think when there's something like that that happens you have to throw a challenge flag that could be the difference between winning and losing a football game um tyson your thoughts uh dicky has his struggles still um like he clearly hasn't learned um he uh it seems to be a, a black and white thing for him unless he i just listened uh to the post game here when i was on the grass here and it has to be a black or, or white thing for him or he will not throw it uh in a way i respect that in a way dude we need a spark it's a close call throw the flag let's you yeah, know um he he's just doesn't seem like an extremely confident coach to me yeah. Um, special teams. Uh, uh, Brett Lowther oh. went uh, two or three, longest 30 yards. He scored nine points. Um, but that is not at all what we're going to be talking about. Um, ten missed tackles. I Help me out here. Like, <laughs> uh, how, how does that happen? I, complete <laughs> lapse of concentration. Complete lapse of wherewithal. Um, I'm led to believe that there's, you know, possibly uh, a missed call in there somewhere. I don't know. I haven't seen it again. Um, I will say this. If you're going to give the benefit of the doubt, you give it to the Bombers. They're, they're twice the franchise we are right now. Um, but in all my years of watching, Caden, I don't remember. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I just don't recall. Uh, an illegal block on a kick return touchdown being overturned by the refs, the panel, or sorry, the command center or what have you. 
I, I don't remember that ever happening before. So naturally it would happen to us, right? Yeah, they it, it looks like they let Mike O'Shea sit there for five minutes staring at that iPad. Yeah. And actually in stadium, they didn't even call the no. penalty in the first place. They didn't even announce it or anything. They, they announced the challenge before they announced the actual penalty. And <laughs> like... Uh, like what's going on here, you know? Or are you like, are you just handing the Winnipeg Blue Bombers some wins? Uh, I'm not gonna go all crazy conspiracy, <laughs> but <laughs> when you hear a number of media people, experts, if you will, right, say the same yeah. thing about Mr. O'Shea, well, then there's some smoke to the fire. Let's be honest: is he paying the league to make us lose? And then, no, God, no, of course not. But when you hear the same expert saying the same thing over and over, there's some merit there, right? Nobody gets to stand on the field with an official for two minutes with an iPad and then decide if they're going to challenge. That doesn't happen. That does not happen. It shouldn't happen. And good Lord, man, the same rules have to be applied to everybody. And, I mean, even if, you know, even, even if that happens, you know, Point point is riders shouldn't be missing ten tackles. Um, no. there were there were excuses made at the end of the game. Oh, they weren't conditioned enough. They 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 just lost focus. Well, you get them running wind sprints. If if I was the coach there, they'd be running down that field. They'd be running the entire field length for every missed tackle. They'd be running nine hundred and something yards. Yeah, I I have to believe that that something to that effect will happen. Right? They're not. You know, we might not have the 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 um, just dictator type coaching staff, but they are a tough coaching staff. They're a proper professional coaching staff, and 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 I know it'll be called out. All right. Well, uh, I think that uh, pretty much uh, touches on all our uh, game topics. Um, predictions for next week against the Calgary Stampeders. Ah, man. It's a game we should – if we had anywhere close to our starting lineup, we will win that game. Um, obviously, we don't even have injury reports out yet. Calgary is a winnable game. We have to win those games. We have arguably the second-best quarterback in the league right now, period. Um, yeah. I'm not sure you can debate that. Um, our defense is still stout. Uh, the injuries are the only thing that makes me hesitant, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it. We're going to go into Cowtown, which will be 50% riders in that stadium. And we'll have a higher attendance the second game than they did their home yeah. opener against DC. <laughs> uh, we're going to take over that stadium and uh, we're going to squeak out a four point win. Yeah. I, I have to, I have to agree with you. I, I think it's going to be, although I think, I think it'll be, it could be anywhere from one to one point to a touchdown. I, I, I think the Riders should win this game, even with their backups. Just Jake Mayer doesn't look like Jake Mayer past this season. The, the Calgary Stampeders just don't look the same without Bo Levi Mitchell. It's just, um, yeah. I mean, but then again, you know, the CFL is is really. Uh, a game you never – it's a league you never know what's going to happen in, and I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if Calgary came out and just shocked the world and beat the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. So um, I think that does it for uh, the uh, Red Review uh, presented by 13K Productions. Um, uh, thank you, Tyson, for joining me today. Uh, it was a pleasure, and um, I guess uh, after – uh, next week's game, we'll come back and uh, we'll review that. Sounds good, my brother. Um, everybody, watch CFL football. We got a good one going on tonight here. Elks and uh, and Lions. And uh, LL Cool J. Oh yeah, it's gonna be performing. Yeah. So <laughs> that's dope, man. Yeah. Alrighty. Cool. So uh, yeah, make sure you guys uh, like, subscribe, uh, go follow us on Instagram at Rudder Review Podcast. Uh, Go follow Tyson wherever you guys can find him, and you guys can follow me on every single social media platform. Um, and, yeah, thank you guys so much, and we will see you guys next week.